Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast, the podcast where we talk Civil War history and bourbon whiskey. My name's Elijah, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jack, and we've got another special episode for you tonight. I'll let Jack get a little more into that. Yeah, thank you, Elijah. We are coming to you from the historic Bell House in beautiful downtown Winchester, which is preserved by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation, official sponsor of the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast. Uh, we got we do have a special episode today, and we are joined to tell us more about this topic, uh, our, our most recurring guest, Mr. Aaron Siever of Aaron's Civil War Travels, to talk about the uh, Battle of Pickett's Mill, the May 27th, 1864 battle, and we're kind of getting Western theater here. So this is an exciting episode, we think, broadening our horizons, and I'm excited to learn more uh, about the Battle of Pickett's Mill and what happens in this area of the country. But before we do that, the most important thing, let's get our glasses full, so I'll hand it back over to Elijah to talk about this episode's bourbon. Yeah, so this evening's pour is going to be Clyde Mays bourbon. Uh, this comes from Conica Ridge Distillery down in uh, Troy, Alabama. Uh, this one's a 92-proof bourbon, aged about four to five years. Um, mash bill on this one, 78% corn, uh, 12% rye, and 10% malted barley. Uh, so pretty high corn content. Should be a, a sweet one, uh, but we'll see how that goes. Um, won a few gold, gold awards um, at a few different spirits competitions, so... I've got high hopes for this one, um, but the man himself, Clyde May, um, you are probably wondering who he is, um, what he's got in terms of ties to bourbon. Um, so Mr. May was a uh, World War II infantryman, earned a, bar- a bronze star and a purple heart, and uh, began moonshining when he came back home from overseas. Um, and that's kind of where the whole uh, Clyde May's distillery got started. Now, that's not to say that he didn't get into a little bit of trouble with the law, Um in his moonshining days, because uh, as you'll see on the bottle, it says legal since 2001. So in his days of uh, shining, he uh, did some time in federal prison, actually, for, uh, yeah, for moonshining when they, when they caught him. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't for a very long time, but the fact that he uh, did some time is enough to, to earn him that, that reputation. But uh, without further ado, we can pop this one open and, and see what we think. But hopefully we've got a good pop here. Great pop. Good one. Ooh, yeah. Good one. Good one. Nice. Off to a good start. Very nice. Yeah, right off the bat, I love the bottle on this. Um, with uh, and you guys will see it in the poor profile picture we'll post on our respective social medias. Ooh. There is a um, there's like a film reel. It's before my time. What would you call that, Aaron? At the top there, you old man. <laughs> the yeah, the reel type. Yeah, it's all yeah. On top looks like it's film, um, and then that beast of Clyde Bay. Posted on the front with some old-timey pictures on the side. Bottle alone, you know, ranks pretty high in my eyes. Um, yeah, cool. Definitely a neat one to have on the shelf just to look at. This one's got a very interesting nose. I know you're still pouring, but this one is just when I pop a cork, you could smell it. Like, I mean, the the the, the uh, nose just hits you right in the face. But this is like, like an orange vanilla almost. Um, it's a lighter. Like, it's not yeah. as pungent. Yeah. I was going to say, too, I don't know if it's because of the label. Looking at the bottle, it's almost like apple cidery in color in the bottle. But yeah, it's a very golden. This one's a very golden color. but it, it's Light I gold, mean, like really light amber. Um, yeah, without, off the bat, the nose is, is, is really impressive for me. I'm take, all right, bottoms up, boys. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's unique. Aaron, thoughts after you just pounded it? <laughs> I pounded that one. He did. He You're not the all first one. Mike Robinson did that. So. Yeah. I normally sip, but I was like, you know what? Let's just, let's just dive right in. It smelled so good. That palette is very, or like the, uh, just the finish in general is like very long. Yeah. It just keeps. It's not super sweet in taste, uh, in my thoughts. And, um, it's not really. I don't know. I almost get like a citrusy. Yeah. Type uh, that's of, where I'm getting that. Not that, that sweet, but like a. I don't know. Like if you've ever bitten to a orange dark chocolate. Yeah, like a the tartness of an orange peel. If you've ever accidentally just bit straight into an orange, <laughs> that's the that's the, almost the citrusy flavor I get from there. Yeah, it's not overpowering, but it's like enough to let you know that it's there, even after gulping it down the burn's really not that bad either so that's that's uh was there an age statement on it 
Um, online it says four to five years on their website. This is so a good sip. Yeah, no, I, I like I, that for for ninety two proof. That's very mellow and yeah, and very uh, just well rounded, full bodied. I mean, it's got a lot of different notes to pick apart. Probably one of the most in terms of what we've had on the show so far. In terms of different yeah. flavors that I'm picking out of this, like orange, vanilla, honey, uh, a little bit of baking like spice. I mean, it's just sour a, apple keeps coming to mind. That's not, fair. Not yeah. like, not like, but like very just subtle. kind of that tart. Yeah, that it's, tart in there. Apple. it's in there. It's in there. It's very, very subtle. But no, I get, I get that, that too. too. Yeah. The tartness, the tart fruit, whatever. Yeah. That's a category you can have on the palate, which I'm sure it is. Um, if it's something, I think this is, you know, for folks that are haven't broadened their horizons when it comes to, um, you know, they're just strictly Kentucky bourbon people. Mm-hmm. This is this is distilled in Alabama, correct? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, there's no reason you can't be dipping your toes south of, south of some state lines there. Yeah, there are and, some purists out there that'll say that bourbon is only made in Kentucky, but that's not the case. Legally speaking, it's anywhere in the continental U.S. But there are some fantastic distilleries outside of Kentucky, and these folks are one of them. Yeah, that's, but, a, that's a nice change of, of pace, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's not... I wasn't sure what to expect with it. So yeah, that's, I'm, it's an I'm outlier for sure. Pleasantly surprised. And it doesn't sit on your palate too long. Mm-hmm. It's not lingering, you know? The burn goes away, but the flavor notes keep popping up here and there, yeah. which is interesting because usually they kind of correlate with each other. They're kind of, you know, as the burn goes away, the flavor starts to go away, but that the flavor just keeps peeking through there. Um, but I will say, um, in terms of this, this is their straight bourbon expression. They also do an Alabama-style whiskey. Uh, it's a little lower proof. I think it's like 85 proof. Um, don't quote me on that. And then they've got some like aged stuff, some single barrels, um, so, and, and some other things like that. But um, this one, if you are just looking for the bourbon, this is it right here. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's Clive Mays in a nutshell, and I think that's a, a good one to have on the show, um, especially with, with getting into uh, Pickett's Mill. Um Battle down in Georgia, uh, next door neighbor to Alabama, and I think some Alabama regiments even served uh, in the Confederate Army during this battle. So, a good little uh, little connection there, and a little segue into into this uh, May twenty seventh, eighteen sixty four battle. So, Aaron, what do you what do you got for us? Tonight? Yeah, so yeah, the Battle of Pickett's Mill, uh, Georgia's part of the Atlanta campaign, uh, eighteen sixty four, uh, with Sherman versus Johnston. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of early still. In the campaign, uh, they're, Sherman is trying to move toward Atlanta to capture Atlanta. It's a big supply hub. Capturing Atlanta in 1864, along with the fall of the Shenandoah Valley, is what's going to actually propel Lincoln to the election, to the win uh, of the election. Uh, and then, of course, once Sherman captures Atlanta after the uh, election results he'll decide to march to the sea to Savannah and then up through the Carolinas and of course by that time the war's over uh, but Sherman is now in command of the military division of the Mississippi uh, Grant was his overall commander is still his overall commander but he's now in the east uh, with the Army of the Potomac um, still overseeing everything and this is part of the grand strategy that Grant had for all Union armies to move south um, so you have stuff going on in the Valley, you have stuff going on in the Overland campaign, and then you've got, uh, this happening in, in Georgia and Sherman, uh, there's going to be several battles fought. And unfortunately, Joe Johnston looks like he's doing the same thing he did on the peninsula, uh, earlier in the war where he's retreating, uh, and he does, he retreats a lot. They start at Ringo Gap, which is right, uh, at the top of Georgia right there on the border with Tennessee, just over the border. Um, I have been there. It's a, it's a really neat little place. There's a little railroad there and you can see the hill, uh, that, that Claiborne who we're going to talk about was actually uh, involved in that battle and and defend it, but they're going to continue, uh, moving South toward Atlanta. Uh, Sherman's going to keep trying to stretch Johnson's lines, going to keep trying to go around him. And, uh, Johnston is is going to have some good counters uh, to what Sherman is doing. Now, one reason uh, Sherman does what he does is because he had spent a lot of time in that area before the war. So he knows the terrain of that area. This is Sherman? This is Sherman. Why is that? Why um, is he just here? because he, he was there um, 
you know, he had taught a school in Louisiana. So he, he's through Georgia a lot. Um, so he knows of, of that area. Uh, specifically, there's going to be a, a spot called Alatoona Pass, and that's where he is going to push uh, Johnston to. Now, there's not really a battle there. Uh, Sherman declines battle, actually. Uh, Johnston, when he pushes Johnston back, uh, Johnston gets his troops in Alatoona Pass, and he's got he's got this great ambush set up. Uh, it's one of the, the times where Johnston's like, I'm, I'm going to fight here. Uh, and I've, I've been to Alatoona Pass uh, in the pouring rain, uh, but when you're in Georgia and you're from Virginia, that's the first time you've been to a battlefield, you, you hike it in the rain. <laughs> um, so I, I actually hiked Rosaka and, and Alatoona Pass that day uh, in the rain and uh, was happy to get to the hotel and dry off. <laughs> but uh, it was cool still. And I was by myself, so I, I was the only one on the battlefield. Uh, but hiking around Alatoona Pass, you can really see how it, there's a railroad that runs between it. Um, the railroad bed is still there. You can see how it would be such a formidable defensive place or a place for an ambush. And uh, Sherman knows this because he's been there. So he says, yeah, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I'm not going down through there. I'm going to go around Johnston. Uh, so he will actually uh, issue 20 days of rations to his troops and they're uh, they're going to march around uh, and try to find the Confederate right flank. Well, what's in what ends up happening uh, is Johnson has fallen back. He he realizes that Sherman's not going to fall into the trap, and uh, the Union forces are going to start uh, really pushing toward uh, Dallas and Marietta, Georgia. And when they do that, um, let me pause you. What are the, where are those in relation to so like the, Atlanta? Uh, they're above Atlanta. Okay. Um, kind of to the east, kind of to the southeast, um, or I guess northeast of Atlanta. Uh, they're little strategic areas. Mm-hmm. Um, Johnson's going to put up a, a massive defensive line uh, by the about the time uh, around. By, by May 25th, he's going to have uh, a really great line at uh, from New Hope Church all the way down Pat, to Pickett's Mill. Um, and, and this is this is part of – Pickett's Mill is one small battle mm-hmm. um, with with a lot of uh, – I don't know how you say it, A lot of repercussions, mm-hmm. uh, consequences, uh, consequences. Uh, a lot of consequences for such a small battle in, in a major campaign. There's like 56 days of fighting that they, you know, we talk about seven days. They're fighting for 56 days Jeez. along the line, retreating and extending the lines. Uh, Johnston, when he realizes that, that uh, Sherman's not going to come through Alatoona pass, he, he thinks about the next move. He's like, Sherman's going to go around and he's going to try to get on my right flank and get to Atlanta. So Johnson extends his line, um, and he's going to take uh, Patrick Claiborne, Irish-born uh, general. He uh, actually, you know, the Irish, um, a lot of at, during the time he was born, uh, are not. Uh, most of them are, are pretty poor uh, before they come over. His family actually was not. His family was uh, very well to do. Um, his dad was a doctor and was actually. Uh, pretty much the main local doctor uh, where he was. They didn't really have city life, even though his dad worked in the city. Uh, they chose to, to be outside the city uh, in Ireland. Uh, eventually they will move and he will actually have a second. His mother dies um, when he's an infant. And so he never really knows his, his biological mother, but his dad remarries and has more kids. I think there's like eight or 10 kids in the family, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but anyway, uh, Claiborne will actually come over here uh, around 1849. So, you know, he's, he hasn't been here, really, when you think about it, super, super long. Yeah. Um, but his, uh, his reputation, he had served uh, in Ireland with the British Army for a little bit. So he's got some background. Um, he's also going to be the general in the Confederate Army that is the first one to bring up enlisting slaves giving them their freedom and enlisting, enlisting them in the Confederate army as uh, soldiers that is quickly going to be crushed uh, when he mentions it. And it's well before this battle. Um, And he's, he's not really going to get reprimanded, but he's basically going to be told 
don't ask that again. Yeah. Um, so, but Claiborne was the first one that comes up with that. Of course, we know 1865, that starts happening. The, the Confederates start going, okay, hey, we'll give you your freedom if you fight for us because they're low on men by that time. Yeah. Um, so Claiborne had some forethought there. And his forethought is what really, uh, really makes him stand out. He's actually one of my favorite generals uh, in the Western theater for sure. They called him the Stonewall of the West. Uh, he's a hard fighter. You're not going to just run over him. Uh, Sherman even says, after the war, uh, they have a toast. Uh, Sherman's with one of the guys. He says, you know, who'd you serve with? He said, well, I served in Claiborne's division. And he makes a toast to Claiborne and said, I knew when we faced Claiborne, we were going to have a fight. Hmm. And he's absolutely right. Um, Claiborne will meet his untimely death at the Battle of Franklin uh, when he's under John Bell Hood at that time, uh, who commands the Army of Tennessee then after Johnson's relief. Um, and that's a that seems to be a pride thing. Um, Hood has, at that time, kind of chastised all the generals and said they weren't they didn't want to fight, and you've got one of the best fighters in the Confederacy, and he, he leads a charge and gets killed. Um, and, and the record for these guys is, is amazing. Uh, they, are, they literally are the equivalent to the Stonewall Brigade in the West. Um, after Pickett's Mill, they fight at, at Kennesaw Mountain, and they save the Army there. They're, they're holding the fort down there. Uh, Pickett's Mill, they're doing the same thing. Uh, so when Johnston figures out, hey, you know, Sherman's coming. He's trying to get around my flank. He's going to detach Claiborne from Hardy's Corps and send him down to his right near Pickett's Mill. Now, Claiborne is going to get there. He gets there about May 26th. There's been some cavalry fighting. And the, the Union think they may have, have found the, uh, the Confederate right by that time. Uh, again, Sherman had issued 20 days rations. So he's, he is now, he thinks he knows all the terrain. He's now marching overland to try to get around Johnston. And, he doesn't know the terrain as well as he thought. He knew Alatuna Pass and above, but to the to the uh, I guess east, um, southeast, he doesn't really know what the terrain is. It's hilly, it's rocky. There's trees everywhere. Um, it is a very thick forest through there, and uh, the terrain breaks up those those movements. Um, it'll actually take him 22 days to get where he wants to go. Uh, but by the time he gets to the area of Pickett's Mill. They're going to attack at New Hope Church, uh, which is uh, to the west of Pickett's Mill, kind of the northwest a little bit, not super far. Uh, but they're going to attack it at New Hope Church. There's going to be a bloody battle there with uh, Hood and uh, some of Sherman's troops. And the next day, uh, as I said, on the 26th, there's a little cavalry skirmish that happens near Pickett's Mill. And uh, that's where... They think, okay, we found the Confederate right flank. So Johnson's going to, or I'm sorry, Sherman is going to send troops out to find that right flank and attack and get around Johnston. Uh, the problem is when he does that, they only have to march two miles. On May 27th, uh, General Oliver O. Howard of Chancellorsville, Gettysburg fame, uh, is now in command of the 4th Corps in, uh, in Sherman's military division of the Mississippi. And uh, he is going to march those two miles, but not thinking about how the terrain is. A two-mile march, they're actually going to get, it's a mile and a half that they get to first, uh, is going to be about five hours. Now, I'm a big dude, but I can march <laughs> two miles in like 40 minutes. Um, but you're thinking about 14,000 men marching over ground that they don't know anything about. It's uh, it's pretty hectic, and it's it's like I said, it's really hilly. A lot of there's open fields, but then there's just randomly you just run into this belt of woods that just seems to go on forever. Um, so at Pickett's Mill, Claiborne is now set up. He, that's where they have decided to put their defensive line. Claiborne has the forethought on the twenty sixth to have a road cut out to his right. Now he is the right flank at that point. Um, he's got some cavalry out. Uh, to the right, uh, and we mentioned about the Alabamians. Um, you're going to have some Alabamian and uh, Mississippi. It's an Alabama-Mississippi brigade. It's mixed uh, under uh, Lowry. It's going to be involved in this. 
Um, you're going to have um, General Kelly, and I believe Kelly actually has some uh, some Alabamians with him as well. Uh, they are going to be on the extreme right. Uh, Claiborne actually has them a little bit in front because he wants to see what the Union's doing. Uh, Howard will finally get on location, and the forethought that Patrick Claiborne had to, to make that road is going to really come into play on the 27th. He cuts that road simply in case he has to move troops that way. They don't expect the Union to come out that far because of the terrain, but it's possible. Um, so you never know. So he sends the cavalry farther out past Pickett's Mill to kind of observe what the, what the Union troops are doing. When Howard arrives on location, he's going to do a reconnaissance. In front of him is an open field, and he decides, well, I'm not going to march down this open field right into the Confederates. That's just stupid. Um, so he decides to go a little bit north and try to find the right flank. Well, as he does so, his troops are going to kind of get moved about. Um, he's going to have Hazen's troops that, that start out, and as Hazen starts marching toward Claiborne, his, uh, his troops, his divisions are going to kind of start to separate. Uh, our brigades, they're, they're going to separate because of the terrain. Uh, one, one's actually just going to wander off toward this cornfield <laughs> that Claiborne has made a road to. Um, and the Confederates, I should talk about their defensive position. They are set up from New Hope Church all the way down to Pickett's Mill. There's a, a ravine in front of them. Uh, they're going to have two 1841 howitzers at that ravine. So pretty antiquated artillery, but at close range, infrared, get the job done. it's going to get the job done. Uh, and the Yankees are going to find that out very quickly. Uh, the attacks will start, like I said, they, they actually started their march at like 10 a.m. The attack, uh, they're not going to really start advancing until about 4.30, and the attack will begin at 5. Um, so Claiborne, as these troops are starting to, to come down, uh, toward him, he sees that they've split. He's going to start kind of shuffling some units to his right down this road. And they're going to end up occupying that cornfield. Um, you're going to have uh, Granberry's Texans are going to be the uh, the first troops that actually uh, the Union engages uh, there. And, and the Texans, they're very well-known unit um, in the West. Granberry is a, is a hard fighter, um, one, of, one of Claiborne's best. Um, and they absolutely devastate Hazen as he comes down. Um, they just they just annihilate him, basically. Um, there's supposed to be support um, from Nathaniel McLean. Uh, he is supposed to be giving support to Hazen and then Gibbon. And uh, then, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Nafler. I never say his name right. I'm sure I'm not saying it right. It might be <laughs> Neffler. Uh, but he's it, McLean is supposed to be giving some support there. He doesn't. He basically stays inactive. Um, what should have taken him a five-minute move takes him 45 minutes to move. And then he just stops. Uh, so there's a backstory to that. O.O. Howard is the general in command of the right flank of the Union Army that is in the air at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Howard blames McLean and several other generals for the debacle that happens there when Stonewall Jackson's flank attack happens and pushes the 11th Corps out of uh, its position and, and starts rolling up the Union line. Howard blames McLean, uh, uh, among other people. Now, I've got a little soft spot for Nathaniel McLean because of the Battle of McDowell. He is there, fights against Stonewall Jackson, and as the Union does lose that battle, but as... They march down, even out of ammunition, he will turn his brigade around and face the Confederates until all troops have come off. He started the battle, basically ended the battle. Is he in um, regimental command? What he's, is he uh, He is in, in um, a, are you talking like? At McDowell. A, a, he's in a uh, division command at this point. At this point? At this point. At, or at McDowell, yeah, regimental. Sorry. Okay. I thought you meant, uh, thought no. you meant Pickett's Mill. Yeah, at Pickett's Mill, he is under... He's under Howard, um, and he has command. I might be wrong on that. He might not be under Howard. No, I'm sorry. He's part of the 23rd Army Corps, 2nd Division. Just attached. Um, he is now a Brigadier General. He's attached to, to uh, 
attached to Howard to to assist yeah. in this attack. Um, but he doesn't like Howard because Howard blamed blamed him. Yeah. For Chancellorsville, so he's just saying, basically, I'm not going to help the dude. Yeah. I don't care what happens. So McLean just sets. Um, it's a heck of a thing to to punish these other troops just because you don't like their commander. But uh, that's exactly what he does. A pettiness. It's a little petty. Yeah. Um. So Granbury's uh, Texans, when they face Hayes in the first wave, they're like I said, they're just going to beat them back. I mean, it's. It's there's no contest there really. Uh, the Union troops as they come in, they're going to get down in this in this ravine, and the Confederate troops are just just going to let them let loose on them. They've got logs piled up, they've got earthworks. It's just it's a terrible attack uh, to try to come up. Uh, at, at some points, I think some of the troops will actually get like right to the walls uh, that they have, but they're just they're shot down. Um, there will be some later in the evening that'll be there. And they're, they're, they can hear the Confederates talking. They're that close. They're, it's like right above them. And they're trying to sneak off in the dark to get back to Union lines. Mm. Uh, after Hazen goes down and, and fights, it's only about 50 minutes uh, that he fights uh, before he's really bloodied. And they start to fall back. At that moment, Howard is going to send in Colonel William Gibson's uh, brigade. And this is going to be the second attack on Claiborne's troops. Uh, that's going to fail as well because there's no support. Gibson goes down. McLean, again, is supposed to be supporting. There's no support. Uh, so Gibson's men will fall back another, you know, an hour later. So we're, we're at two hours of battle, and the Confederates haven't really budged. Um, they've even moved troops, you know, farther down to kind of plug a hole that, that occurred that really wasn't there to begin with. Um, so around 6, uh, Sherman... His troops are going to receive orders to to end this attack. Like, it's a debacle at this point. It's terrible. Um, nothing has went the Union's way. And unfortunately, before that order gets there, Howard is going to order Neffler. Uh, and his, uh, he's going to order him to the front to, to check the Confederates. Well, the fighting is going to continue there. They're going to fight back and forth. Meanwhile, the Union had continued to try to go to the right even farther. So while Granberry's Texans are fighting, there's a lot of pressure on uh, General Kelly, who's under the, who's the cavalry leader. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on him. And so when those Confederates come down the road toward the cornfield and get, get up against him, uh, they're going to be able to stop the other little prong of this attack. It's kind of like a two prong attack. Uh, not necessarily intended that way, uh, but uh, you're going to have Scribbler King and, and Carlin that are going to come down on the far right, um, and and they'll be excited because they find they actually finally find the far right, and uh, one of them will say, "Ah, damn you! We've caught you without your logs." <laughs> um, the problem is they don't get very far. Yeah. Uh, they come under intense fire uh, from uh, Lowry and uh, Kelly. And uh, actually, Govan, uh, who is uh, in the line next to Granbury, will move out and move off to that farther right. Um, and his, uh, his troops will end up beating back um, the advance of Scribbler King and, and Carlin. And it's just, it's an absolute, uh, just an absolute, just a battle that should have never happened. Um, how many? So how many uh, troops were McLean? So was McLean in command of? Uh, at this McLean point? has. He's in command of the first brigade. So he's got about fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. So if yeah. you're looking at, I mean, that's a considerable size, well, and, given that if you've got fourteen thousand you, federals, yeah, you've already got fourteen thousand federals, and you're taking that fifteen hundred basically away because he's not doing anything. He's not really doing anything, and you're facing Claiborne, who. Uh, you need an advantage with anyhow. Yeah, Claiborne's got about 5,000. So, yeah. I mean, you've got a major advantage there. Uh, and uh, of note, he also has a guy, it's Brigadier General Polk, but not Leonidas Polk. It's Lucius Polk. Uh, from Any relation? Confederate. Actually, yeah, it's his nephew. Um, so Lucius will be, uh, will be in this battle as well. He's actually uh, the left of Claiborne's line. And he's gonna he's gonna have some fighting going on there as well. But he's he's kind of looking at McLean. I mean, he's participating against Gibson and Hazen and uh, Neffler. But he 
McLean, he sees McLean. He's waiting he's for it, but it just there. never comes. He's just there. Uh, meanwhile, while this is going on, the Union are going to actually uh, – a major bombardment's happening up at New Hope Church. So that's supposed to be a, a diversionary attempt. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Sherman ordered this attack. He knew about it. He never says anything about it after the battle. It's not in his memoirs. He doesn't write a note about it. I don't even know if he talked to a friend about it. But there's no mention of it from William T. Sherman. It's as if it never happened. Now, do you think he was kicking himself for not having those troops present I, I down think, here at Pickett's Mill instead of up there? I for think a, a little bit of that and also betting on that he knew the terrain that he didn't know. Um, it should have never taken those guys five hours. But if you don't know where you're going, you know, How, Howard at one point will send a message back and says, I think I found the Confederate right flank. I think. He's never sure. Um, and then when he actually does find it, it's too late because now there's reinforcements there and the Confederate right flank has extended. Um, so he's never sure of what exactly goes on. And then to, to even add to that, during the battle, there's going to be a shell that hits near Howard and a piece of it's going to come up into his foot. Hmm. Now, he's actually just going to get a really bad bruise on his foot because the thickness of his sole uh, of his shoe was, it was very thick. And so he gets a bad bruise, but in his mind, now this man's already lost an arm. He, his first thought is I just lost my leg (laughs) and I'm going to bleed out. I'm going to die. And uh, they set him down and he realizes, you know, Oh, this is painful. I can't really walk. But I can still direct stuff. So now he's Howard at one point is actually sitting on the ground directing units where he needs them to go. Uh, by the time this battle's over, it's it's really only about a two hour battle. Um, darkness has started to set in. Uh, Neffler is there to just hold the Confederates back. That's all they want to do is hold them back so that they the Union can make a defensive line now uh, above Pickett's Mill, facing these entrenched Confederates. Uh, and they're going to start doing that. They're going to start digging in. The Confederates, however, are not going to sit idle. Um, Granberry's going to go to Claiborne and say, hey, you know, my guys did some really good work today. Um, and, and mind you, they only have like 300 casualties during this battle. It's not they, – they don't have near um, the amount that the Union will have. Um, but, you know, Granberry's going to say, hey, I've, I, we did really good work. The Yankees are there. We don't want them to, to come up the ravine in the middle of the night. We should attack them. And Claiborne's basically like, well, well what are you, you know, proposing? And Granberry says, I want to take everybody. Let's go. <laughs> and, uh, and Claiborne He's says, okay. About it. He's like, okay. So these guys come over their earthworks and dive down into this ravine mm. that they've been fighting the Yankees at. Uh, one guy even says, like, he, wa- he you couldn't see anything. They just, you know, if they saw a muzzle flash, they fired at it, but they're charging fixed bayonets, coming down with some hand-to-hand combat. Um, but he says he, one of his, his compadres, like, just runs off a rock ledge and dies. Like, he's not shot, nothing. He just off the rock because he couldn't see it. Wow. He was charging, um, and, and he's killed in a charge, but not by the Union troops. Wow. He's killed by the fall. Um, and it's, it's just a massive – Attack and it pushes the Union even farther back. By 10 p.m., uh, Neffler is told to completely uh, withdraw. Um, and yeah, his brigade uh, is trying to withdraw at the same time this charge happens. So I think part of it is Granberry probably heard the movement and the whispering and all of that. And he's probably thinking an attack. It's actually going to be a retreat. Uh, so they're they're going to fire kind of a volley at these Texans guy, <laughs> but the Texans are just they're uh, they're coming and they're taking a bunch of them prisoner. Um, throughout the night, you're gonna these guys are going to be very close in the no man's land where this ravine and stuff is. They're going to hear all the wounded and dying there. Um, Howard uh, actually writes a little uh, little piece about what. Uh, what he witnessed uh, there at Pickett's Mill. And it, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I, I was going to read what he said. He said, uh, this is what he says about Pickett's Mill. During the war, a few sad scenes impressed me more than any others. 
One was the field after the Battle of Gettysburg. A second scene was the Battle of Antietam. But these things, not happy to relate, were matched at Pickett's Mill. Now, Gettysburg's three days. Antietam's bloodiest day in American history. Pickett's Mill's like two hours. Let that sink in. Wow. Oliver Howard, who's been at both of these, he got, you know, he doesn't even mention Chancellorsville. Um, he's been at both of these major, huge battles in the East, and he is saying Pickett's Mill is equivalent. Um, that's, that's pretty powerful to me. Um, he says that opening in the forest, faint fires here and there, revealing men wounded, armless, legless, or eyeless. Some with heads bound up with cotton strips, some standing and walking nervously around, and some setting uh, with bended forms, and some prone upon the earth. Who can picture it? A few men in despair have resorted to drink for relief. So the sad sounds from those in pain were mingled with the oaths of the drunken and the more heartless. And that's coming from the guy that is leading this attack. Um, and again, you know, he's wounded, uh, not a serious wound uh, for him. But uh, his men, you know, we often hear about battles where they say, you know, I could have walked a mile across. I, at Pickett's Mill, literally the, the Confederates, the hillside is just dark blue. The ravine is filled. There's hardly any Confederate dead there. It's all Union troops, um, which is crazy. Uh, they... Uh, it's just, it's an absolute blunder. As a matter of fact, a guy that is part of this battle and, and writes books afterwards, Ambrose, um, Ambrose Bierce, he will actually write a book about Pickett's Mill called The Criminal Blunder. He calls it a criminal blunder. He's just stupid. It should have never happened. Um, now, he, he says that, that Howard only committed one sentence uh, to it. He summed it up in one sentence. Obviously, Howard had a couple more sentences than that, but he's angry. He witnessed this, you know, and the troops never moved. But here's what here's what Beer says about it. It is ignored by General Sherman in his memoirs, yet Sherman ordered it. General Howard wrote an account of the campaign of which it was an incident and dismissed it in a single sentence, yet General Howard planned it. And it was fought as an isolated and independent action under his eye. Whether it was so trifling an affair as to justify this inattention, let the reader judge. Um, so top brass is kind of right. Top this, brass this is writing this off. Uh, just a minor skirmish. Yeah. This, in this, fact it's, it's, it's a bad look is what yeah. it becomes. Um, you've got, uh, you know, all these troops and, and they should have overwhelmed the Confederates. Now I mentioned those howitzers. Those howitzers are firing down into that ravine. When, when the Yankees come, when these charges happen, mm. they're infilet. They're firing down the line. And it is absolutely decimating these guys. You've got the musket fire here. You've got the cavalry and rifle fire. And then you've got two, yeah, old cannons, but they're shooting canister straight down the round, down the ravine. Mm. What are you going to do? It, it's, it's hell. Um, the victory that the Confederates will have will embolden them to attack the next day. And they're going to attack uh, not far from Pickett's Mill uh, near uh, Dallas, Georgia, not Dallas, Texas. Uh, <laughs> Dallas, Georgia, uh, that will be a Confederate defeat. But How many days after Pickett's Mill? The very next day. So May these 28th. same Confederates will shift. They'll shift a, a little bit farther to the right. And, and Dallas is more of a well-known battle. It's my understanding, correct? Dallas, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bigger battle. You have Dallas and Marietta. Yeah. Um, it's a bigger battle lasts a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the end becomes a Confederate defeat and ends up causing Johnson to retreat more. Um, but, but Sherman will stay on this line. Uh, these, this new hope church line is, is what they call it. He'll stay on that line till sometime in June before he makes another move. Um, once he does that, that's when, uh, Johnson will will pull back. So how are we looking in terms of total Union casualties? For yeah, what's the, I mean, I was ask, casualties? what's the casualties here? Let's see. Because here. for them to write it off as a uh, a yeah, minor skirmish or just a, a little action incident, it, I, I think <laughs> I think the casualties will will uh, yeah uh, so contradict that. If we look at the Army of the Cumberland, which is is mainly who uh, 
who we have here. Army of the Cumberland. Army of the Cumberland. Now, you got to remember in, in Cumberland the, like we're talking Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, Cumberland, okay. Cumberland Gap. Okay. So so you have the military division of the Mississippi has the Army of the Cumberland, mm-hmm. the Army of the Tennessee, um and I believe what's the other army there, Jack? That's uh that's within the Union Army. It was three armies. Um that kind of got consolidated in the Western theater. I can't remember what the third one is. Um, but Sherman ends up commanding all three of these mm-hmm. armies and, uh, they're all part of his district. Um, I want to say it's like 1500 casualties or almost 2000 casualties. Army of the Cumberland, army of the Ohio and army of the Tennessee. Yeah. That's okay. it. Army of the Ohio. Sounds about right. Um, I want to say it's, yeah, I just knew that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out Google. <laughs> Good job, Google. 1,500 compared to, what are we thinking? In terms yeah, about of Confeder- 300. 300. Yeah. Casualties I mean, for Confederates? Yeah. The yeah, casualties right are only that. about 300. Wow. Uh, Union, I think it's like fifteen to 2,000. 1,500 to 2,000 mm-hmm. total with wounded. And, and the now, they may be... Confederates are outnumbered here, obviously. Oh, big time. But... Big when are they time. not? It's, but you having... Yeah, that's what I was again saying. Actually, one of the other battles we may talk about in the future, they will not be. Oh, Spoiler alert. There's, no, we didn't spoil anything. No spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alert for Aaron. For me. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it, it's just a, uh, you know, here, here's one of the, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. I Go was ahead. just, no, no, no. I was just going to say, um, yeah, I mean, they were dug in. It's like, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what almost, your size is, as long as you can fill the line. Almost uh, reminiscent of uh, like a Fredericksburg style of, of fighting. Although yeah. you're in the mountains rather than, you know, along a river or something like that. But but just the way that it plays out is almost like a Western theater Fredericksburg. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, Claiborne, you know, I talked about his forethought for, for cutting a road. He also has the forethought of, I'm not going to cut. Normally, you would cut fields of fire. He didn't. He left the underbrush. He left the trees. He did that on purpose because he knew... It's cover. They have to come through yeah. at me. They have to go through that to get to me. And I've got a ravine in front of me, and I've got brush. And they won't do it. They probably wouldn't risk going through that, not knowing what they're going to get get into on the other side of that. Yep. So just you may as well keep extending the line until you can get to a point where you can see it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, when the Union troops come down through there, um, they, they come right at them, uh, you know. And, and these you've got guys from Alabama, uh Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi. These guys are, you know, they're Texas. hardened troops. Texas. Yeah. yeah. Got some Texans out there. Um, they're hardened troops. And they are, um, if I remember correctly, I think the Texans either didn't trust the Ar- people from Arkansas or Georgians. One of, the, one of those two, the Texans weren't, there was one group that they weren't very, they said, hey, don't you guys run or we'll shoot you in the back um, during oh, this wow. battle. <laughs> um, and, and they don't run. They actually perform very well. Um, but like I was saying, when the next morning, uh, the chapter in the, in the book recommendation I'll give, uh, chapter 16 is actually called The Great Blue Carpet. Yeah, uh, just because wow. of the... Just because of the mass amount of casualties. Um it's amazing that they would try to write that that incident off for as many casualties. I mean, fifteen hundred beats. I yeah, mean, enough. it beats some more notable. In a, well, in a couple hours battle, yeah, yeah. In, in just a few hours. And I mean, it it does go into nightfall, but the the main fighting is really uh, just those few hours. And the and amount of time itself, I think, just kind of that much casual. There's that much uh, uh, bloodshed in, in that. Short of a period of time. I mean, yeah. you don't see that very often. Uh, I'm sorry. I had the Confe- Confederates 500. Mm-hmm. Uh, Union losses are 1,600. Wow. So 1,600. Um, and, and, you know, this is a major Confederate victory in the Western theory. And it doesn't get talked about, you know, obviously by the Union because it's, it's an embarrassment. Well, even uh, still today, I don't think it gets talked about as much as it should because when you look it up in terms of, like, trying to find a battle map for it yeah. or – heavy documentation of like the movements and all that stuff. There yeah. are other smaller battles that are more well mapped out and documented. Than oh, this absolutely. One. And this one, I mean, just by what we've talked about should have, you know, you, you would think a cartographer would, or a historian would, you know, map out that battle to a T just because of how much is going on well, here. Yeah. And, and the great thing 
Um, shout out to the Pickett's Mill Battlefield Foundation. They have saved pretty much the entire battlefield at Pickett's Mill. That's awesome. Um, it's state run. It is. It was uh, established, I believe, 1991. So it, it's not really that old of a park. Um, I have been there, and it is amazing to be there. The terrain is pristine, and you can really see why it, it is what it is. Yeah, you can see the you see the ravine. Um, and of course, there's an Aaron Civil War Travels video on it, but uh, you know you see the ravine, and, and in the video, I'm standing there, and, and you can look behind me and just tell. It drops. That's a hell of a drop. Yeah. And those guys were charging down it and then trying to charge up the other side. Um, of note, one of the howitzers was found in the bottom of the Atlanta Museum. And they traced it back and found out it was at that battle. It was one of Claiborne's howitzers. Wow. And it is now in the Pickett's Mill uh, Visitor Center. Wow. So it's That's literally awesome. yards from where it was setting. That's wow. awesome. So, yeah. Very cool. It's not on the same carriage. Um, yeah. Go figure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the carriage they stuck it on, which even the historian there was like, I don't know why they did this. Uh, it's, it's not a cannon carriage. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's more like a, just a regular wagon carriage. Huh. <laughs> um, and it's, makes uh, or the wonder. wheels. And so it makes you wonder what, what how many going. casualties that, that cannon alone was responsible oh, for. Yeah. Those 1600s. Yeah, just shooting those things down the, down the ravine. Now, how far is that ravine from the Confederate? It's defense. directly in front of them. Like how how many yards would you say roughly if, if you were to like guess? Ten. That close. Ten, ten it to, drops. Ten to fifteen. And it, it just starts sloping down. Oh are, the, my are there God. remnants of the earthworks still there? Or? Yes, there's okay. still remnants of the earthworks. You can walk all the way down to the cornfield. Um, you can walk the Union lines. Uh, and, and really, you know, at one point there's one of the signs there, and I turned around and looked, and it is so thick. Um, we think about the wilderness and how thick that was during yeah. the battle. Mm-hmm. This is, it's equivalent in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, and then when it opens, you go into a ravine. Uh, so, so really you don't have any, any uh, respite from, from being uh, along the deadline there, um, which is actually what this line will be called from New Hope Church all the way down. It'll be called the deadline. Wow. Um, what a crazy, so yeah. crazy, crazy story. It's absolute, you know, Definitely a debacle, and, and I, I like. I mean, you have the the part with McLean and Howard too. Yeah. And the Eastern Theater issue happened, and now we're in the Western Theater, and it's affecting these guys. Still can't figure it out. And they can't get over it. Has this ever been depicted in film? That I don't know. Make it may have movie. been. It make would make a, a great movie. story. It really would. Yeah, it'd be yeah. a really cool. Uh, cool. Cool movie, uh, Ron Maxwell. If you're listening, yeah, or Will Will Eichler, or Will Eichler. We've got a yeah. idea for a Civil War movie Whose now. Whose birthday it is when this episode drops? So oh, August, nice. I mean, what is it? November fifteenth. We're in November. 15th. Yeah, yeah. yeah, November fifteenth. Happy birthday, Will. Will's a good friend of the podcast, and uh, he brings great historical events to life. Um, but if you want to watch some of the things Will does, and uh, like like a segment that the Battlefields Foundation has partnered with Civil War Digital Digest, which Will is the face of um, the Fridays of the Front series. It can all be found in many other great historical shows can be found on History Fix. Uh, you can join and, and join on there for movies, documentaries, short films, and how-to videos. Historic eras currently range from the 1st to 21st centuries. Um, the team of curators over at History Fix Fix bring you the most comprehensive and authentic authentic historical content available. Battlefields and Bourbon podcast listeners and fans, if you're listening right now, you can receive an extra 20% off your first year's annual subscription to History Fix with code BATTLEFIELD. So if you sign up at www.historyfix.com and use promo code BATTLEFIELD, that's B-A-T-T-L-E-F-I-E-L-D, all one word. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. After signing up, you can download the History Fix apps, most places you stream your shows from. Uh, escape into history with History Fix. Myself, I am a History Fix subscriber. Not free. Paid for that <laughs> before this. And uh, I will continue to uh, subscribe every year because of the content that's on there. Aaron, are you We're a subscriber? Yes. yes, I am. Yes. So quality stuff coming from History Fix. Like I said, you can watch... That Friday's the front series that tells you what's happening uh, with some of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields work. Um, 
with some of the preservation efforts there and things like that, but also just a wide variety of, um, of, of great history films, uh, shows, short clips, things like that. So use Coast Battlefields if you're listening to get history fixed today, 20% off. Elijah, I don't know what you're waiting for. Get on the train. One uh, day. Yeah, but a great a great story would uh, would be something that a history fix should have depicted, I think, one day. Pick I its mill. I mean, this this battle, it's a couple hours. We've got a lot of cool things in. We've got, you know, the the thing with Chancellorsville. Yeah, you got, got those a, connections. We've and, got a night attack. That doesn't yeah. happen very often. Um, in, in which, you know, the Confederates are like, yeah, let's do it. Um, you know, just a, a ton of action packed action in a couple hours. The Atlanta um, campaign in general as a, uh, oh, man. split up as like a gods and generals style of, you know, cutting to this battle, to this battle, to this battle. I think if you did the Atlanta campaign in that fashon, that would be, doesn't get enough credit. Hit. So it, doesn't. it no. definitely needs a light shined on it. If you get a chance, um, so, Jack, you know this. When Aaron Civil War Travels decides to go traveling, sometimes it's just at the last minute and might end up in Vicksburg or <laughs> Atlanta. Uh, so a couple years ago, that's what I did. I went, decided to go to Atlanta. I left at like 2 a.m. and uh, drove straight through. I got to Ringgold Gap just as it was getting light and ended up at Tunnel Hill and um, Rocky Face Ridge, just a ton of battlefields, Duck Gap, um, it, it was just, it was an amazing little trip. And, uh, one of the battles that was on my mind was Pickett's Mill. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about it at the time, but it just, it's, it, it just stuck out to me. Uh, you know, I got to, to New Hope Church and everything, and, and there's still some earthworks there to see. Um, actually one of my, one of my YouTube followers and Facebook followers actually lives right next to him. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, he didn't tell me until after I was there, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I could have had a free supper, I guess. But, um, anyway, uh, being able to go through that and go through Atlanta and, you know, Ezra church and things like that. And then you get to this pristine battlefield because Atlanta's, you know, developed it's and, developed. Yeah. I mean, Ezra church, uh, there's a park there right now. And that, that's a big battle. Yeah. It's a big bloody battle. And, so it's a pretty pristine landscape. Yeah. So folks can go down and visit that state park. Cause you said there's a visitor center. Yeah, there's a visitor center there. Um, I was showing Elijah here that the uh, first and forty first Ohio. Uh, Jack, I'll show you the picture here. That's that's the ravine they're going down. That slope Steep. right there. So the trail is right there, and the Confederates are just up on this ridge. Um, Any monuments out there? Like, was there any post war? No, no, just put signs. Them. <laughs> yeah, just signs. Well, I meant like, was there any, you know, the veterans, do they put anything I up to mark there? I didn't see their... anything or hear anything that they uh, that they had put up. Okay. Um, I don't, I think just because of the terrain, it hasn't really. Um, I mean, it, it almost got kind of written off too. Well, so. it was written off and, and you think about too, 1991 is when this thing gets saved really. Yeah. Um. And, and shout out to the farmers and everybody for not destroying it, destroying developing, it, the developing land. it to whatever. Yeah. Um, we've that, unfortunately lost a lot of battlefields that way. That's, I think one of those battles that obviously for the fact that it's been written off by the higher ups, one of those ones that I think the, uh, the uh, enlisted men would probably want to forget as well. Not one that you would want to put a monument to. Cause I mean, as, at least as far as we've talked about, there's no, you know, outstanding merits of, of valor or bravery by the Federals. I mean, they've just kind of got it handed they to were, them. Well, I mean, they got it handed I, to I them. I the would say, battle. I'd play devil's advocate here. Those guys, I'm sure, would love to do it. But the fact that, you know, in the post war era, and when you go to reunions and you go to things, and some of these people that survived the war and write their memoirs, the you officers. You want to celebrate your greatest victories, not yep. your your lowest. Those defeats. things too. And if your if your officers and people that were leading you during the war survived the war and write things and are in the public eye, if they're not giving it credit, you're yeah. not going to want to claim that too. Um, Focus on the uh, the the big victories well, and the good memories, you know. And you, and there's also the other point of looking at the the amount of casualties. A lot of times, historians, people will will look and go, "Oh, twenty one hundred casualties." Nothing. That's nothing. Yeah. They don't look at how <laughs> it was just in a couple hours. I mean, this yeah. this was this. And we can say this with every single battle, but from the perspective of these men, I'm sure 
um, especially the Federals. This was their Gettysburg. This was their, you know, this this was their biggest battle, um, especially for the the families of the men that never made it up the hill in the ravine or never made it back out. Um, this is you know this is their biggest battle, especially you know for like yeah. I said those families. Definitely. When you um, call those, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so fine. you call those numbers? I mean, it's just numbers on paper for. For us modern historians yeah. where we interpret, oh, just 2,100. But to those men that were there in that ravine fearing for their lives, you know, every single person falling next to them, they're thinking, am I going to be next? Oh, yeah. yeah. Am I the next we one that's going to We can't even fathom get? it, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to, to, to relate to that. And I think that's probably another, another big reason why that's not something that those soldiers would want to recall or, or, or memorialize or something is because that probably brings back some pretty traumatic, you know, memories and stuff, because I can't imagine that that's something that you want to go and tell your friends about. Yeah, yeah. we were, we were here. We did that. That's yeah. not something you want to recall. You want to recall your glory days and that's not one of them. And, and for these union troops at the end of this battle, all they're thinking about is getting out of there safe. Right. If they pop up, they're shot. Like the the Confederates were shooting at sound at some points. Well, and um, it gets overlooked by Dallas the next day. Yeah, Dallas the next day. And, and what's what's the condition of that and, battlefield? Um, not a lot there. Yeah. There is so behind a bank. There's a large field uh, where a charge happened. There's a bridge that takes you on out through the woods, but it's really oh, okay. Not Pickett's Mill is probably the most pristine of this stint of battles. Correct. Uh, of this line, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, if you're talk, if you go a little farther, Rosaka, very well preserved. Um, there's still obviously a lot there. Uh, it's a little creepy. You be in, you know, I was an officer for a long time, but you pull into a sheriff's office to read one of the signs with cannons there, and you know all the deputies are kind of looking at you uh, as they're pulling out of the jail. Uh, <laughs> so, like, what you know, they got to be on on uh, on a high alert. So. Um, and what's uh, what's what's your book recommendation? So, so this, there's this there's episode? actually two, and I I would love to find Ambrose Bierce, uh the Criminal Blunder book. Yeah. Um, but this one is by Brad Bukovich. Let me see. What's that? B u t k o v i c h. Uh, it's part of the Civil War uh, sesquicentennial series by History Press um, or Acadia History Press. Pre- yeah. Um, and, and yes, yeah, History Press, and uh, it's it's called the Battle of Pickett's Mill along the Dead Line, which is also another um, thing that Ambrose Bierce called this battle. Um, it's pretty detailed. So it's got its own book, which is pretty. Yeah, it, it's very detailed. He's he's got. Um, I mean, for know, a two hour battle, that's a decently thick book. I mean, yeah. Well, he, something a battle I've never heard of, and I don't know everything, but you know, I know some stuff, and I didn't know about it until Aaron mentioned it to me. He's like, this is my favorite battle right now. I love this battle. I was like, okay. It was definitely my favorite Western theater battle. Oh, for sure. I see why. And I apologize. The park opened in 1992. He's even got the history of how the the park came to be uh, in here. Um, And it's just, yeah, it's uh, a really, I I encourage you to definitely go there. Uh, One of the coolest battlefields I've ever, ever been to. Um, Yeah, and the amount of of attacks, there's six... Six Union, uh, six attacking federal brigades, <laughs> you know, and they can't they can't crack the line. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely a, a cool place to go. Um, and, and I'm going to give a shout out here. Yeah. We're talking about birthdays. <clears throat> so as we are uh, doing uh, when this episode drops, Will Eichler, you said his birthday. So uh, the week before. Uh, Mr. Will's birthday, so it would have been Tuesday, what, the 7th, I think. Uh, that is um, Oliver O. Howard's birthday. I'm sorry, the 8th, Wednesday the 8th, uh, is Oliver O. Howard's birthday. So, um, yeah, Happy know, belated birthday I, to O. Howard. Yeah, O. O. Howard. I mean, you know, hopefully he gets my card that I sent him. <laughs> um, and and I'm, not, I'm not one of these historians that goes and, and poo-poos on Howard all the time. Yes, he screwed up at Chancellorsville. But you look at him at Gettysburg, he doesn't get the credit he really deserves at Gettysburg. Um, he could have simply continued retreating. Yeah. Uh, instead, he sits up on the hill that he and Reynolds had, had probably talked about. Um, and so, yes, got to give Hancock his his uh, 
laurels for for the battle of Gettysburg, but oh how oh Howard doesn't doesn't do too bad there. Um, Pickett's Mill actually, I think, even with the debacle at Chancellorsville, is his worst battle. Yeah. It's just, it's, I mean, there's just nothing you could do. There's no, there's no good that comes out of it for the yeah. union. So, well, awesome. Well. Thank you so much, folks, for listening. Thanks to Aaron yeah, for coming thanks, on guys. and talking, doing our first Western theater battle. Um, this will not be our last. We've got Aaron locked in maybe for another Western maybe. theater. No, our Western um, folks are, are probably happy to, to get some love out there because I know we've been just kind of focusing heavy oh, yeah. on the, uh, the uh, Eastern Virginia. Thing, so. Yeah, the next Western battle that we talk about is like my second favorite. So. Yeah, so we'll just go into that. but. Yeah. Um, thanks you so much. Don't forget to reach out to our, uh, contacts either in our DMS or private messages or emails that are posted with, with recommendations for topics you'd like to hear people you'd like to hear on. Um, maybe we can't fly them out here, but we can sure as heck get them on a FaceTime or zoom call and, uh, love to chat with them and, um, sit and sip and talk some things. So we appreciate you folks for listening. This was the battle of Pickett's mill. Uh, and this was Clyde Mays. I think I had my second glass. Aaron, you didn't have time to even think while <laughs> talking. <laughs> Just it back. And uh, Elijah, you had a couple of final thoughts on the Clyde Mays. Clyde Mays, uh, definitely one to go check out, something you'll find on the shelf. And it's very, very tasty, very affordable. Um, definitely yeah, one affordable that I'll, I'll keep sure. on my shelf for sure. That's that's some awesome stuff. And hopefully they hear this and they keep up the great work because that's, that's some good stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely surprised me for... I don't know. I, the bottle impressed me, but you never know sometimes. And you, you can't assume all bourbons are good, but this was really good and light and almost refreshing in some aspects. So. I'm, I'm planning on stealing the bottle when you guys aren't looking. Yeah. <laughs> That's our <laughs> That's parting good. gift. But yeah. uh, Well, thank you all for listening and uh, tune in for the next one. Thanks, guys. Thank you.